Thank you. I want to talk to you about creating a better planet right here on Earth. And as soon as we get that first slide up there, uh, all right, there we have it. We, this is the only home you and I will ever have. It's the only home our children, our grandchildren, our great-grandchildren will ever have. And we need to reframe our relationship with it so that it will be a sustainable relationship. Joseph Campbell said, everything begins with the story. So the elements of the story that I want to tell you are the following. Humans evolved only after the evolution of a life support system that took almost all of the history of the Earth. Population grew, we uh, developed societies, we began to consume things, and we find ourselves in a situation where we have put ecosystems and the services that they deliver that are called critical ecosystem services at risk. We need these for the human race to survive. We have the knowledge, we have the creativity, we have the tools to create a sustainable future, but it will not just happen. The context then is that we are confronted with the most urgent, important, serious design problem we have ever faced in the history of humanity. <clears throat> Here we are, see a wonderful shot of the Earth. Earth is four and a half billion years old. Life has, exi has existed on Earth for about three and a half billion years, and it took 99.9% .9 of that time for the conditions to be right for humans to enter this arena. We are actors now in a great drama. Everything that went before created the stage for us to thrive. We have biodiversity, we have ecosystems that deliver ecosystem services that provide clean air, clean water, rich, productive soils. And we have a climate that was created for us when we first arrived on stage that was propitious for us to thrive. And thrive we did. Our numbers expanded significantly. And we now have the, uh, something in our population of 7 billion people and it has grown exponentially. In the last century, population more than quadrupled from 1.6 billion people to 7 billion people, and it continues to grow. It's on target to reach 9 billion by the end of this century, or by 2050 rather, and to reach 10 billion by 2100. So our, our success as a species is really quite remarkable but success came at a cost. Our consumption increased even more rapidly than population. If you look at the figure that's going to be on, on the screen, it will, you will see that in 1965, when our population was 3.3 billion people, we used about 70% of the Earth's land, water, and air to produce what we consumed and to assimilate the waste that we produce. By the 1983, the population had increased to 4.7 billion, and now we are consuming things more rapidly than Earth can replenish them. This is called ecological overshoot. The overshoot continues to grow, and this is one of the major factors that we need to deal with. Our global commons. A commons is something that belongs to everyone, and to no one. We have two global commons, the atmosphere and the ocean. They're life support systems for humans and for everything on this planet. And we have fundamentally altered them. In the last 200 years, we have increased the amount of CO2 in the atmosphere over pre-industrial levels by about 35%. This is primarily because of the burning of fossil fuels and secondarily because of deforestation. About half of that CO2 that was added to the atmosphere since the Industrial Revolution has been transferred to the ocean. And as it is transferred to the ocean, it has increased the ocean's acidity by about 30% over what it was 200 years ago. 
All of this causes consequences. The Earth's temperature has risen by about a degree and a half over the last 200 years. The Earth's climate is changing. That's an undisputable scientific fact. And the ocean and the atmosphere are a coupled system. And as we've changed the atmosphere, we've changed the ocean, and you will see in the next figure that we have lost about 40% of phytoplankton biomass. Phytoplankton are the microscopic plants in the ocean that account for about 95% of all of the primary productivity in the ocean, and they account for about half of all of the oxygen that you and I breathe. And as a result of increased temperature of the ocean and increased ocean acidification, we have lost about 30% of all of the coral reefs in the ocean. Coral reefs support about 25% of all of marine species of fish, and they have the greatest biodiversity of all marine ecosystems. The ocean creates the conditions on Earth for life, including human life. The environment has changed throughout geologic history and throughout the history of life on Earth. Animals and plants have coped with change by either adapting or evolving. Something's different now. The rate of change is more rapid than at any time in Earth's history, and as a result, many plants and animals are unable to keep up. Extinction is part of evolution. But the rate of extinction now is between 10 and 100 times more rapid than at any time during Earth's history, except during those periods of mass extinctions. And we've had five, five of those. E.O. Wilson and, and colleagues have stated that by the end of this century, we could lose half of all existing species as a result of human alterations of habitats and the rapidly changing climate. And recently, the UN issued a report that within the next 30 years, we could lose 25% of all species of mammals. It is the biodiversity and the ecosystem services that you and I depend upon for our survival. We have this lead role in the drama of life on Earth. It's the first time any single species has played this role. And it, it's a very important role. Throughout most of the history of humans on Earth, that goes back 200,000 years, only 200,000 years, we, it has been improvisational theater made up on the spot by the most innovative, creative species ever to have lived. But now we find ourselves in a situation where we have to combine that creativity and innovation in a more coordinated, collaborative script if we are going to continue this drama of humans on Earth and have it have a very long run. <clears throat> Our challenge then is really to preserve what is the, uh, the Earth's natural living infrastructure, biodiversity, and ecosystems. And see, these are some of the major problems that we need to confront. Overpopulation, overconsumption, habitat destruction, energy use, particularly our reliance on fossil fuels, climate change and its effects, agriculture. If there were one thing, that human activity, that has the greatest impact on the ocean, it would be agriculture. Loss of biodiversity and ecosystem services and poverty. All of these problems fall into a category that are called wicked problems. They're a different category of problems. They're different from complex problems. Putting a man on the moon and a rover on Mars, those were complex problems. It took thousands of engineers and scientists to figure out how to do it. But they had very clear goals and objectives, and there were quantifiable metrics of success. Wicked problems don't have clear objectives and goals. They don't have quantifiable metrics of success. You have to surround them with people with different perspectives and take a lot of time so that you are addressing the right set of issues, the right set of, of questions. There's no silver bullet. There's no optimum solution. There's no right answer. If you're lucky, you end up with a portfolio of partial answers that in the aggregate 
will minimize regret. And here, here you see a cartoon of these. And it's the complexity of the individual issues here and the interactions with all of the others because they're all tied together and they are all interconnected across the world. The grand challenge then is how do we figure out how humans can live sustainably on Earth? And essentially we have to create an entire new relationship of humans and the Earth and we need to create new relationships among peoples. Victor Hugo once said, there is nothing like a dream to create the future. The best scientists, engineers, artists, designers, poets, even politicians are dreamers. Sometimes they give us nightmares. <laughs> we need to have a big, bold dream of a new planet right here on Earth. It needs to be a dream that has people working together across the planet to slow the rate of environmental change so that nature can catch up. And it has to be a dream that includes the more than one billion of us on this planet who don't have access to clean water, to sanitary facilities, to adequate housing, to adequate food. Those people aren't just in the, in the developing world. Every night of the week, somewhere around 75 to 80,000 people in Los Angeles County sleep on the streets. We have to have a much more inclusive set of solutions. And it's going to require broad scale change. The one thing that makes this possible is that we now have the emergence of a new commons. And this is the information commons. For the first time in the history of humanity, we are able to share data and information in real time across the globe using the internet. Cell phones are increasing in numbers more rapidly than population, and it isn't just in the developed world, it's also in the, the developing world. So we have opportunities to communicate, to collaborate, to share data, to transform data into information. Information is data that is configured to deliver a message or to tell a story. And knowledge is information in context. The context that we need to be looking at are local issues, local situations. Translate that into wisdom and into action because it is only through local and regional actions that are aggregated and scaled up to a global set of approaches that we are going to be able to redefine the relationship of humans with Earth and create a sustainable situation. Often it's hard for many of us to envision a vibrant alternative future. That's one of the, the places where art and design absolutely have to enter the picture and help us. That's one of the greatest areas of strength. So my takeaway message is that this challenge that we have of redefining the relationship of humans with the earth is the most urgent, important challenge we have ever had. It is something that we can do. It will be a different world, to be sure. And if we could have that next cartoon, please. But it, it not only will be a different world, but it could be a glorious world. It is within our power to, to do this. It can be a more just, a more equitable world. It can be a world where billions of people are empowered with the tools and the information and the knowledge to collaborate and to innovate, to create solutions across the planet so that we can have this new global commons, information commons, that's made up of thousands and tens of thousands of communities at local and regional scales. <clears throat> and it is up to us. It's the design problem. So I want to close by reading a short poem to you by Kate Barnes. She's a New England poet who lives in Maine. And it's called, Why Do You Ask? I can't make any story about my life tonight. The house is like an overturned wastebasket. The radio is predicting more rain. I ask my dog to tell me a story, and she never hesitates. Once upon a time, she says, a woman lived with a simply wonderful dog. <laughs> and she stops talking. Is that all I ask her? Yes, she says, why do you ask? 
Isn't that enough? Ladies and gentlemen, even when the world seems like an overturned wastebasket, we live on an absolutely magnificent planet. It's the only planet we will ever have, and we need it. Isn't that reason enough? <laughs>